Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 371, a focus on the benefits of hormone replacement therapy. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Dr. Maupin and I just returned from a medical convention in Tucson, where the whole focus of the presentation the, the reason that these doctors come together is to talk about hormone replacement therapies, whether they are advisable, whether they're good or bad, what to do, how to do to make the best outcome for your patients. But a good deal of the discussion that always occurs in these events is discussion about the limiting uh, agencies or agents that try to interfere with the message about hormone replacement treatment and and say oh it's not a good thing to do it's not a safe thing to do it's not a recommended thing to do and then they spend time presenting all this research and all this information that says we have these miraculous results we have these results that people are looking for that can be done without negative side effects and it's beneficial and doesn't cost a whole lot of money and blah 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 and then they stop and say however the systems in power, the decision-making regulatory systems, not only the federal government, but of the American Medical Association, Mm -hmm. come out and say, oh, we're not sure this is safe. You probably don't want to do it, or you only want to do it in the most extreme circumstances where you build a case of justification uh, to protect yourself legally. Uh, So, so for instance, uh, the Food and Drug Administration regulates a lot of this, and they say, well, testosterone for women it's not approved. We're not going to say there's it's no a indication. good treatment for women, even though there's enough medical research to fill this room to say women make testosterone. They lose their ability to make testosterone. They benefit from having testosterone. There's a natural testosterone that can be put given to them to replace the testosterone that they've lost. And it comes with all these ancillary benefits without very much in the way of side effects. And we can talk about what those are. We know. And so it's out there. But then the regulatory agencies say, well, no, don't do it. And all the different medical societies, the endocrine societies, uh, the gynecology societies, the uh, heart specialists, uh, I mean, almost all of them say, don't do it. <laughs> While at the same time, their their own journals are replete with articles that say, hey, look at this. Yeah, this, hey, it works. you know this? Hey, this is interesting. But all the public hears? Yeah is that the AMA said don't do it and that the the college of OBGYN said don't do it and then so so why is that so one of the one of my beliefs is that you know you would think that the American College of OBGYN would actually be representing their members right and we pay to belong to it and you know and we pay to be board certified and you know every time you right. turn around you have to pay for something for this for what, all the medical organizations that you belong to. However, the way the American College of OBGYN works is they get a lot of money from the drug companies they, and the medical device companies. Those people put money into their journals and into their um, their conferences. They they support the, the sponsors, conferences. Gold, they sponsor, sponsor yeah, bond, the gold, sponsor. yeah. Yeah. So so all of this is really the big money, not the money from the doctors. Yeah. So. So you have to always say, where's the money from? Right. Well, the money's from from the drug companies and from the device companies. So in the end, our college doesn't really represent us, and they don't ever come to help us. I mean, if we had, a, if we had an unnecessary lawsuit, they're not going to help us. Mm-hmm. They, would, they, they just go, <laughs> you know, you got insurance for that. Right. So they don't advise us. They don't ha- I mean, really, there's very little that they do for us for – managing all of these OBGYNs except to hold us back because if they hold us back from new and innovative and God forbid cheaper uh, kind of treatment, then we won't need all those other drugs. It's almost as if it operates in restraint of trade. It does. 
It does. I mean, they're always looking at how do we restrain you from doing something new? And how do we restrain you from their, they, <laughs> their level, their basic level of care that they say we should follow is so low, like minimal of everything, minimal treatment, minimal drugs. You don't have to do this till somebody's dying. I mean, it's not preventive medicine. It's not medicine that you would want if you had knew the choices you would want the best medical treatment, but well, they, they just say, here's the lowest that you can offer. And that's our, our basic, uh, what we say is necessary. Well, let's talk about specific examples. Uh, if you hear the word cancer, most Americans, when they hear the word cancer, immediately think death sentence. And for so many years, a cancer diagnosis represented a death sentence. And many cancers it does. And, but now we but, know, we make distinctions. There are a lot of different kinds of cancers. And most of the people who get a cancer diagnosis don't die. Mm -hmm. Some still do. Some we don't have answers for or treatments for. But some we've learned more and more about. And it is not automatically a death sentence mm -hmm. to say cancer. And the one that scares women the most is breast cancer. Right. And, and so they... They presented a slide in one of the presentations that said what most women think they will die from. And the slide said they'd surveyed all these different women, mm -hmm. said that mo between 40 and 60 percent of women say, I'll die from breast cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, 15 to 18 percent said, well, I'll probably die from some cardiovascular system. My family heart has attack. heart issues. And if something takes me, that's probably what it'll be. Mm -hmm. So then they did the research to find out what kills most women in America. What do they die from? And the answer that they found was that they actually die more from cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. from heart attacks. 53% of the women die from heart attacks. Mm -hmm. And only 4% of the women die from breast cancer. That's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing how the marketing and, and the media manipulation around the issue of cancer causes us to remain so frightened. We've not right. done a good job of saying it is no longer automatically a death sentence to get any kind of cancer or most kinds of most kinds of cancer. Oh, so, so, I mean, I have a problem with journalism that yes. always is looking at, I mean, journalism is journal. We've written a book. We know, we, I mean, how but, are we going to sell this paper? Yeah. Yeah. It's all about scare tactics. It's all about shocking public, yeah. the public. And so it is not news anymore to say, that only 4% of women die of breast cancer. I mean, that should be on the front page, well, but that's not going to make people afraid. So it doesn't get, get the emotional reaction. Well, what they say is dog bites man is not a story. It doesn't sell. Uh, man bites dog man is. Man bites dog is. Right. Exactly. So something that's very unusual is what sells right. or very scary is what sells. So this is, this is one of those situations where we have a lot of information here that is very reassuring and... Mm -hmm supports what we've been doing for years and years, and that is offering estrogen replacement therapy and testosterone replacement therapy and, and pure progesterone replacement therapy to women who need it and who are, are symptomatic or who just want to prevent all the other things, all the other diseases that can happen if you don't take it. So we've been doing this knowing that our patients get better. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have, to, I don't have to read an article that's a research paper, I can read it and say, well, that doesn't ring true for my patients. There's something wrong with the article or it's something that is specific to that group of people, but not my patients. Right. So, so you have your own clinical sample. You've right. been doing this for 15 years and you have thousands of patients. I've been doing it for 30 years. Well, the HRT. Hormones. I've yes. been doing HRT for 30 years. For 30 years. But not, not so, the bioidentical so pellets. What happened systemically was that the hormone replacement treatment market, if you will, as a market, uh, was growing exponentially in the United States and in Europe. Women were saying, this keeps me alive. This helps me. I feel better. I have all these ancillary benefits. I can have sex. I don't and have pain. And the doctors that treated those women said, amen, this is good. Let's mm -hmm. put you on this, uh, especially when you're uh, postmenopausal. Mm -hmm. we, you will need this. Then they did a study, which was an erroneous badly constructed study and halfway through the study they closed the study because the results that they were getting from the bad science said oh my god hrd will kill you you get breast cancer or heart attack, and heart attack and die so the media 
was told that, hey, we canceled this research because we want to warn everybody everywhere, this will kill you, don't do it. And that became the mantra of the Doctors Association mm -hmm. and of the media around the United States. They said, oh, my God, don't do HRT. If you're a woman, stay away from estrogen replacement in particular. It will give you breast cancer and heart attack, and you will die. And that's the problem with media and the, the title. Whatever they put in the title is all anybody reads. And the real problem there right, right. was that one part of the study had a drug called Provera in it. Provera is a type of progestin, not progesterone, progestin, that is dangerous. Mm -hmm. The FDA has not touched it since this study. They've not done anything. They've not restricted it. But that's what caused the heart attacks and the breast cancer. Right. Progestin. Right. So this, this particular progestin, Provera, was the problem, but the arm of the study People who have a hysterectomy don't take progestins. That arm of the study, now it comes out, all those women did better. They got less breast cancer and less heart attack. Mm -hmm. So if you take if they if you take estrogen only and not this Provera, then you have less than someone who takes nothing. Yes. If you take it with Provera, you get more. So they misinterpreted the whole thing. Doctors didn't bother to read the study. I did because it didn't look like what I see in my office. So one of the studies that they quoted at this conference that we attended has done research on the damage that was done to the health of women when the mass media and the regulatory systems all converge to say, oh, my God, don't take estrogen replacement. It'll kill you. Secondary to the WHI study. So Secondary everybody kind of knows what study. that is. So they did a study called The Mortality Toll of Estrogen Avoidance. And it was published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2013. Mm -hmm. And it said between 2002 and 2013, they estimate as many as 90,000 women died as a result of not complications from not replacing their estrogen. Right. So it led to the, the absence of estrogen among these women led them to be susceptible to a variety of illnesses, cancer and heart attack being two of them, mm -hmm. but others as well, that led to premature death. And that if they had been given estrogen all along as, as, as an available uh, and considerable treatment plan, they think many, if not most of those women would not have died. I mean, cardiologists know this. They know that estrogen prevents heart attack. In fact, my cardiologist, when I got a zero scan on or zero mm -hmm. level on the cardiac calcium scan, he goes, well, that's because you've been on, you've been on estrogen since you were 20, 47, he said. Yeah. So that's why it's, he, it's also true that testosterone in the form that we give it decreases plaque, but my vessels are clean according to my cardiologist, well, because I take estrogen. And that's what the research that we saw consistently was showing, is if you started taking HRT younger in life, mm -hmm. then you avoided the buildup of plaque in mm -hmm. your arteries that would lead to cardiovascular problems and death. Uh, if you wait until you're 65, 70, and your plaque is already built up in your arteries, then taking HRT won't protect you from right a heart attack or, or cancer. That, and that has to do with not what I thought. I thought right. I thought one thing, but what it does, I don't want to even say what I thought because it's silly now. But after the plaque is built up, the receptors for estrogen in your arteries are no longer sensitive to estrogen. So after all those years, when you start taking the estrogen, if you've not had exposure to it for more than 10 years, then your vessels don't dilate like they do when you, you take estrogen and you're younger. But if you take it the whole time, they continue to dilate mm -hmm. and they continue to stay clean and not to, to get plaque stuck on the walls. Yeah. So it's the receptor sites that die right. if you're not exposed to it. Well, and, and so to compound all the turmoil around this, as recently as September of this year, 2017, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, actually reported on a study that covered uh it covered the same it, it followed the people that were in the uh whi study for right. 18 years for 18 years over fifty thousand women mm -hmm. they, they studied them uh and they said if they had taken hrt for between five and seven years mm -hmm. of their life that there was no viable valid definable connection to taking HRT, 
and having breast cancer or heart attack. They said there is no data that supports increased mortality from taking uh, hormone replacement therapy. So be careful about how you interpret the, the data. You should always do that when you look at statistics and research. They're not saying this will prevent you from having uh, breast cancer or uh, dying from a heart attack. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is there's no evidence that supports the claim that it will increase your risk of dying from breast cancer or heart attack. And it may, and it may, and it may decrease your risk of both. Right. And that's what the most important part of that study was for me. Right. It not only won't increase your risk, mm -hmm. it may decrease your risk. Mm -hmm. It, but I always tell patients, if you're coming to me and I'm giving you estrogen and testosterone, you could still get breast cancer if you have breasts. Right. I mean, that's well, especially if you have the, if gene, you have now that the we know. gene for it. And, and if, if you have the biggest risk is being overweight and drinking alcohol. Those are the two biggest things right. that increase. It's your not risk. hormone replacement. It's not how it's much not hormone replacement. testosterone you have. No, it's, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with those how much two gym things beam? and your genes. Yeah. You know, it, it could be wine, but it, it, it's just, those are the two highest risk factors besides smoking, which everyone knows. So uh, the doctor that presented this particular presentation was Dr. Gary Donovitz, and mm -hmm. he was identifying uh, typical questions that women will ask if they come to a doctor's office mm -hmm. to have a discussion about, is HRT the way for me to go? Mm -hmm. Is this a treatment that I should consider? Mm -hmm something that I should have. And he said, we need to have answers for these questions. We do have answers for these questions, but we need to polish those answers to make them readily absorbable and understandable mm -hmm. in the female population that wants to consider HRT, especially mm -hmm. because of all the adverse publicity and erroneous publicity over the last 16 years since mm -hmm. the WHI study. He said, women are going to ask, will this cause me to have a heart attack? I've heard that it will. Mm -hmm. Women are going to ask, will this cause me to have a greater likelihood that I will develop cancer, in particular breast cancer? I've heard that it will. And it does. And the answer to both those is not only no, but hell no. Absolutely no. There is no data that supports the increase in risk in heart attack or cancer, breast cancer. No, no data done with a well done study. I mean, a right. reasonable study that wasn't skewed for some reason. Right. Or tampered with. Exactly. So you can always find a study somewhere. <laughs> so then the next question is, will it cause blood clots? And you had a, a patient that came from Australia mm -hmm. because she had started developing blood clots and, and flying. Uh, an elderly lady mm -hmm. that flew long hours to, mm -hmm. to get from here to Australia. Mm -hmm. Her son was a physician, contacted mm -hmm. you after having read your book and said, is there something you can do for my mother? Because she wants to travel. She's in she a was position take, to travel. And she was taken she off. Yeah. She was taken off her estrogen and no longer can she not fly. No longer. She was so, she had agoraphobia. She mm -hmm. couldn't leave her house because she had no estrogen. That's some, some, these are some of the unusual th side effects of not taking estrogen anymore. Right. So what I did was I, ch I checked her for the seven genetic tests that tell a person whether they're at risk for a blood clot. And she had one that told me that she needed folic acid at high doses, and then she would be normal. So basically, I said, I'll give you estrogen. It, it's not your genes. It's not, it, it was the long flight, no, no support hose, not moving for all that time. Plus, you hadn't taken enough folic, enough folic acid. acid. Right. So if we do these things, you're at no higher risk than anybody else. And you're going to get, you're going to be at lower risk because you're going to get up and walk around. It wasn't her estrogen. They treated the wrong thing. Right. So that's how I, so that's so blood why blood clots is not a, a marker that says, oh my God, don't consider that's, HRT. That's right. It is not. All right. Uh, hair loss. Hair loss is from testosterone. He was talking about the side effects of testosterone and estrogen. Uh -huh. So um, testosterone is associated with hair loss, but only 1% of the patients who take testosterone get hair, hair loss, 1%. And usually if they have hair loss from low thyroid or high cortisol or uh, poor diet or, um, sorry, but often vegans have very thin hair because they don't have enough protein. Right. And so... Which so doesn't have to do with their hormones. It has nothing, none of those things have anything to do with your hormones. But if you're on testosterone, every doctor that I've ever heard of says, who doesn't know anything about this, right. says, oh, it's your testosterone. And, and they walk out of the room. Right. And they, they don't give you an answer and they don't work it up. So 
So, <laughs> so that's a huge problem because doctors don't even know that. So it's only 1% who are going to get hair loss and the hair loss from testosterone occurs here and here. So it is not all over your head. All over your head means something else. Right. So, so having hair loss here and here, we, when we recognize that, that means you have really sensitive receptors. You're ex accepting the testosterone, turning it into DHT in the hair follicle, and hair is falling out. So we, we take steps to, to prevent that. that. To, so, the, but it's 1%. DHT. It's not 50%. Or right. It's, not, it's 1%, which is negligible. Well, and the second question they ask you about hair is if I'm not <laughs> going to have hair loss, will I grow a beard? And that also is no under my care, no. Right. I give people spironolactone, which is a very benign medication to prevent that. And that is in people who usually had hair on their face before they started this, and then they lost it when they lost their testosterone, and then they don't want it back. So we do that, or we use saw palmetto, which is also a supplement you can buy over the counter. And that's for people who have very mild hair growth or they have blonde hair growth, and they just don't want that. So these, these are all questions that Dr. Donovich says, as a physician, you're going to be asked these questions. You mm -hmm. need to have accurate and reasonable and absorbable information to give your patients mm -hmm. so that they can make a good decision. That's right. And, and patients, we, we absolutely believe you should always be an active part of the decision-making process. You need to be an informed consumer. Well, so if it's the doctor incumbent says, on us to give you it's your testosterone yeah. and you have hair loss all over your head, you need to grab them and say, come back here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not my testosterone. Well, I mean... It, you need to talk to me more about this. Please, you know, give me the time. And the last most common question that, that gets asked for which we need to have a reasonable and defendable answer mm -hmm. is, will it make me fatter? And that's no, because when you go through menopause as a female, you immediately become insulin resistant. So all the carbs that you eat immediately become fat. So menopause makes you fatter, but adding estrogen and adding testosterone actually makes you able to lose the weight. So that is, but you also can't eat all the carbs. I mean, that doesn't go away. You're still more sensitive to carbs than you were before menopause. So menopause makes you gain weight, but not hormones. Yes. So the uh, hallelujah come to Jesus message <laughs> is you don't need to be afraid of HRT treatments. You need to have the research and the information so that you can make an informed decision. It is not a panacea for all things. It is not uh, recommended for all people, but there are specific people who need it. There are specific definable circumstances under which it is needed, and there are identifiable safe gains from getting it. So do your research, talk to your physician. What we keep finding at these conventions is there are still too many old doctors out there who are preaching what they were taught in med school, who haven't updated their knowledge base. Or young doctors who are repeating what the old doctors taught, taught them. them. Yeah. So, so push, push and don't for be afraid. consideration. And don't yeah. be afraid of this. If you need it, you need it. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.